James chapter 4, we'll look at the last verse of the chapter. The Bible says, and this is the, the verses that we read in verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Will you read the verse aloud with me together, please? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your precious word. Help us now as we look into it. I pray that you would guide and direct us throughout the scriptures. And Lord, I thank you for this great truth. Help us, Lord, to just do right, I pray, in every area of our life to please you, glorify you. And Lord, we ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message is Just Do Right. And the subtitle might be something along this line, but I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> You ever, you ever uh, caught somebody uh, doing something, you know, and I didn't, do it. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything. And maybe they didn't do anything wrong. But the question God asks of us, did you do anything right? It's not enough for us as Christians to be able to say, uh, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't run with the girls that do, you know. It's, it's not enough for us to, to just abstain from things uh, we are to obtain some things. There were some uh, uh, kids that were in, in Sunday school, and, and the teacher was trying her best to get across to them uh, this, this thought of uh, sins of commission and sins of omission. And uh, so afterwards, she was asking some questions. And you know how kids kind of zone in and out, you know? Kids have a short attention span. Teenagers have a short attention span. And uh, uh, it's, it's just the way, it's the way it goes. And so she called on this one boy, Jerry. He said, Jerry, uh, tell me what uh, the difference between the sin of commission is and sin of omission is. He said, well, a sin of commission is something that we've done already. He says, sin of omission, omission is a sin we haven't done yet. Well, he had half the truth. He had half the truth. And I encourage you to look, please, at verse 17 once again. And the first word, say it with me, please, in verse 17, together, therefore. Anytime you look at the word therefore, wherefore, because, or it's, it's contingent. It, it's hinging on something else. And so those are the verses that we read together publicly. Uh, the Bible says, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. The word vapor is the word from uh, atmos, from where we get the word atmosphere. It, it might be something like you get up in the morning and, uh, and it's misty and it's foggy and you can't see, you know, and, uh, and then in just an hour, all the fog is gone. It's all burnt away. That's what the Bible is describing and comparing our life to be. It is like a vapor. It's there and then it's gone. Therefore, it says, therefore, dealing with the will of God and the will of God for our life, and, and someone said this, that, that failure is succeeding at the wrong thing. Failure is succeeding at the wrong thing. You can be successful at the wrong thing and be a failure. That's why God uh, tells us here in this, in this chapter that we're to seek after God's will, not to devise our own plan, our own path, and, and, and go our own way, but, but, to, but to seek His will and to surrender to His sovereignty. If the Lord will, I'm going to go and do this thing. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So as we're going, submitted to God's will, it's not just the things that, that separate us from the world, that they do that, but I don't. What do I do for God? Just do right. You can, I, I'm going to give you these three things quickly. You can waste your life. You can spend your life. You can invest your life. By way of introduction, uh, you, can, you can waste your life in sinful pleasures. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.25 said that Moses chose rather to endure afflictions with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Any preacher that says that there is no pleasure in sin is a liar. The Bible says that there are pleasures in sin for a season. It'll turn and bite you. It's fun for a little while. If it weren't fun at all, why would people sin? 
But yet, God wants the best for our life. He wants to give us the very best things, the things that are uh, riches forevermore, he said, at my right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Luke 8, verse 14. You know the reason why a lot of people come into church and they're bored and they're, and they're just, just uh, distracted and they, they zone out during the preaching, during the singing, and they wonder, gracious days, when are we going to be over with this? I hope it's having something good for lunch. And, what am I going to do this afternoon? All that kind of thing. We're planning things out instead of focusing our attention. You know why? Because the pleasures of this world, as Jesus talked about it in the Gospel of Luke, the pleasures of this world choke out the seed. If we are feasting on the pleasures of this world, whenever the true bread of life comes our way, we don't really want it. After all, if you've been eating M&Ms and... Uh, uh, Twinkies and all these other things and you filled up and then your mama brings out beef stew and you've you've filled up on junk food you've had all the chips you can eat and uh, your, your Cheetos oh don't talk about Cheetos man I haven't had Cheetos in I don't know how long you can't eat just one and then when you think you're done you look down at your fingers and they're orange and so you don't waste that. <laughs> Don't wipe that off. And then that just, that just primes you to get just one more. <laughs> and we fill up on junk food. So in the real good food, the stuff that's going to sustain you and nutrients and carry you and give you strength and all that kind of thing, regular uh, whatever, uh, all, all, the, all the good things of life, we say, no, I, I'm, I'm pretty full. That's why people come into the house of God and have no hunger and thirst after righteousness because the, the, the pleasures of this world are choking out the seed of this life. We can waste our life in sinful pleasures. By the way, Satan will help you with that. And we can, number two, we can spend our life in selfish pride. We can spend our life in selfish pride, just doing things for us. Not really, you know, sinful bad things. There's nothing wrong with having toys. There's nothing wrong with having interests and hobbies and activities and, and sports and, and uh, a house and, and, and adding on things and trying to make things as nice as possible for your family. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. It's not a sinful thing, but sometimes it can become just a selfish pride thing. Sometimes. Sometimes you can use those things that God has gifted you with for His glory. You can use it as a witnessing opportunity. You can, you can use it for God. So you can have a Bible study over at your house. Uh, you, you can have a, a neighbor help you with something uh, that, that, that you're working on at your house and, and use that as an opportunity to witness to them. I mean, you can use things that God has put in your hands for His glory. Having things is not sinful. But what our purpose in life is, it could be, look at me, selfish pride. And when you come down to the end of your life, you're going to leave it all behind. Leave it all behind. You can spend your life. I'm not wasting my life. I'm spending it. But let me show you the better way. The best way is to invest your life. Invest your life. Um, you can waste your life in sinful pleasures, spend your life in selfish pride, invest your life in scriptural purpose. Do you remember when Jesus, as a growing boy, was 12 years of age. We find in Luke 2, 49, that whenever they, they went to Jerusalem as a family, they journeyed to Jerusalem, and they thought that Jesus definitely was with the crowd, with the other, with the other boys his age and all that kind of thing. They traveled three days' journey. They couldn't find Jesus. They went back and, and, and thought, by the way, there's a great spiritual lesson in that. Uh, you'll find Jesus where you left him. But anyway, uh, they, they went back and they retraced their steps and they found Jesus there at the, at the feet of the Pharisees and the priests and all that. He had been for the past few days talking with them about the Old Testament law, talking with them about no doubt prophecy, talking about all these things, asking them questions, answering their questions. After all, he's the one that wrote the book, amen? And he said, wished ye not that I must be about my father's business. He was investing before his, ever, before his ministry ever began publicly. He was investing his life 
in God's business. Invest your life in spiritual, scriptural purpose. Matthew 6, 20 says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor inflation nor deflation nor anything doth corrupt. And where thieves do not break through nor rioters break through and steal. I'm adding some things. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're to invest our life. Just do right. Uh, D.L. Moody said this. He said, if I take care of my character, my reputation will take care of itself. Um, one man said, character is doing what's right when nobody's looking. That's what character is. And Bob Jones Sr. said this, the test of a man's character is what it takes to stop him. I encourage you, please, to look at the things that you're doing with your life and the time that you have left. If you're going to be 80 years old, you say, oh, gracious, I'm way past that. Some of you are past 80. Do you realize, according to God's Word, that uh, in the Old Testament it talks about three score our, our life, 60 years. And if by reason of strength, an extra 10, 70. Some of us are looking at that and we're saying, wow, God has really blessed me. I'm at 75. I'm at 80. I'm at 85. Some of you are 90. How many of you are 90 years old in here? Anybody? Anybody 90 years old? Right over here. Right over here. 90 years old. Right back there with the graph. 90 years old. Folks, God's been good to us, hasn't he? In the time that we have left, in the days that God has given to us, teach us, Lord, to number our days. There's a Christian young man, and he didn't have much opportunity to get a job, but the best job he could find at the time was at a pawn shop. And this young man, he decided that he was going to serve God as best he could, even at the pawn shop. And one day, God convicted his heart. He sat down, and he, and he wrote something down. As a young man, he wrote this down. He said, by your grace, God, I'm going to promise to you that I'm going to get up early every morning. I'm going to pray no less than five minutes every day. I'm going to vow to you that I'm going to read at least four chapters of the Word of God every day of my life. By your grace, I'm going to be a zealous Christian telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he put all those things down and put some other things on, on the paper. And he signed his name to that, and he kept that paper. He signed the name William Booth. William Booth later went, went on to lead thousands to the Lord Jesus, Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, and he founded the Salvation Army. The decisions that we make in our daily life put us on a path. Today, you might make a decision that will put you on a path that will bring glory to Jesus Christ and bring great praise to his name. Um, I, I believe it's Charles Spurgeon that wrote this, a good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you. Carve your name on hearts, not on marble. You don't have to have a tombstone to be worthwhile. You need to have people that will say, she had an impact on my life for the Lord Jesus Christ. She changed my life. He had an influence that no preacher ever touched. No preacher ever attained the influence on my life that he had on my life. May we attain to that. Just do right. You've heard the saying, evil prevails when good men do nothing. It is time for us to do something, folks. Our time is short. I believe the rapture could not be far away. And that's not just a time rejoicing. Do you have treasures laid up? Well, when I turn 18 and I get to be an adult and I can kind of have my fun, you know, all that kind of thing, then, then I'll, I'll get serious. You know what happens when you turn 18? You say, well, after college, you know, college, I got to have, I got to have my fun in college. And so after college, you know, then, then I'll... And you go through college and, and, and you say, you know, as soon as I get married, I'll get faithful in church and I'll get faithful in the Word of God and I'll settle down when I have... You know what you do when you, when you get married? You get busy with somebody that's the dream of your life and you say this. Well, you know, we're just too busy. 
uh, going and doing. When we've got kids, when we've got kids, that's when we're going to get serious about serving God. And then when kids come along, you've never seen busy, have you? Like when the kids come along. Well, Lord, you understand. I mean, we're going to soccer practice and school and play practice and all these kind of things, and we're just running and gunning. We just don't have time. We'll, we'll try to get to church as much as we can. We really I know it's important. I know it's important. But as far as me personally, I'll get really serious. I'm doing a good thing taking care of the kids. When, when, when they get more like teenagers, that's when I'll serve you. Really? And you find yourself looking at one another, uh, getting ready for retirement. You think, what have we done for the Lord Jesus Christ? And if the rapture happened, what will I have to present to him? Just do right today. Do something small. In your eyes, do something small. And continue on with that. And add something more. And add something more. Let me give you three uh, this morning. First of all, walk with God. If you're going to do something right, then start with this one. Do like William Booth did and walk with God. Micah 6, 8 says... He hath shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. In order to walk with God, you need to listen to him. You need to listen to him. Now, you need to listen as the word of God is preached, as the word of God is taught, as songs of praise are sung to him. Listen to him. Listen for him. Now, if, if we have unconfessed and unrepented of sin in our life, you're not going to be on his frequency. There's going to be static on the line. You're not going to hear his voice, even as a believer in Christ. You might hear his voice through circumstances. <laughs> you might hear his voice in an accident. You might hear his voice in the emergency room. But as far as just communing with God, you're probably not going to hear that still, small voice. You need to hear the Word of God. Not just the Bible. You need to hear the Spirit of God speaking to you. Listen. Listen for Him. The American public is allergic to silence. It doesn't matter. Nowadays, you got little things that you put in your ears, like, like high-tech, uh, what are they, uh, secret service guys, you know, like presidential candidates, you know. you got stuff stuffed in your ear, and, and, uh, and, and you can tie it to your phone, and, and, and everywhere you go, you know, you're just, you're, just, you're just going. You know, you got music going all the time, something going on, because we don't like silence. Be still and know that I am God. You need some silence. You need some time to meditate on the Word of God, to ask God. If you ever ask God when you get to a, a, a difficult passage, you ever ask God, Lord, what does this mean? Say, well, that's weird. I mean, you know, you're going to actually hear a voice, uh-huh, in your heart, that still small voice within your heart. You see, the Holy Spirit is the interpreter of the Word of God. He's the one that will help us apply it. I'll tell you, folks, when you take a, a roll of biscuits, Pillsbury or something like that, and you take it and you hit it on the side of the counter in the kitchen, you know, or you take a spoon. I always hated to do the spoon. It's like I was you know, setting off a bomb, you know, the edge of the spoon and things, and boom, you know, plastique, you know. But, uh, but, but you, open that, you open that thing up, and then, and, and, and then you think, you, you just look at it, and it's... A little bit like firm slime. Each little, each little hockey puck. Each little biscuit, you know, and, and it, it kind of kind of sticky and things. And you know what it's going to be like in just a few minutes. You're gonna take that pan, and and uh, if you're if you're scared of your wife, you will spray the pan. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and then and then you'll 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 put them in there. Now, I'm the kind of guy that doesn't like to wait very long. But I have never, never given into the temptation of taking a bite of that cold biscuit. It's the same stuff. It's the same stuff. It just hasn't been in the oven yet. Now, listen, please. Hear me. Reading the Word of God without the Holy Spirit turning on the heat and the light is like taking a bite of the biscuit before it's been in the oven 
But when the radiance of the shine of glory of God gets in your heart and amplifies what the Bible is, is saying and, and drive it into your heart and apply it to you, now you're saying, wow, give me some butter. Got any honey? Ooh. I won't say anything about gravy. That, that's, that's bad for us. Walk with God. Listen to the Lord. Labor for the Lord. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Labor. Whenever the Lord says do this, don't argue with him. Just say, yes, Lord. I'll do it. When the Lord says help in the nursery, yes, Lord, I'll do it. It's not necessarily about wiping snotty noses. It might be that you're going to be paired up with a lady and their ladies that you can have an impact. Some young lady in there, that's their first time at having kids. Hmm. Remember what that's like? And they just had one child. This is the first time in their nursery, and, they're gonna, and they don't know anybody else in the church. And you're going to minister more to that young lady in that nursery than you're going to have an impact on any of those babies. As you're taking care of the babies, God's going to use you in that nursery to touch somebody else's life. I don't know if, if it's some parent you're going to minister or whatever. It's as you're serving God's blessing. Listen. Listen. Somebody's calling. You better listen. <laughs> better listen. What if God calls you? Walk with God. Walk with God. Uh, and, then, and then next, second Second of three, witness the gospel. If you're going to do something right, if you're just going to do right, just do right, walk with God, listen to the Lord, and labor for the Lord, and then secondly, witness the gospel. Acts 1.8 says, Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. That's at home. And in Judea. That's outside nearby the home. That's at work at school with your neighbors. And in Samaria. That's at the store. That's on, on, your, on your duties. And in the uttermost part of the earth, that's where we partner together as a body of believers, as a church, as a body of believers. By the way, folks, that's why we are a church, a gathered, called-out assembly. We're, 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 we're the family of God locally right here in Volusia County Baptist Church in Orange City. Well, I don't know about joining churches. You know, churches, they mess up. Absolutely we do at times. We do. That's why we have a Savior. There is no perfect church. There is no perfect country. There is no perfect pastor. There is no perfect politician. We all are in need of a Savior. But this is a place that God needs you. And you need to say, yes, Lord, if this is where you want me to be, then I'm going to sign up. You can count on me. I'll do something for you. That's what he wants you to do. Witness the gospel. Pick up gospel tracks on your way out. We've got some new gospel tracks. I don't know if they're in the track rack yet. They're, they're prepping them. Came in this week. And uh, it's, it's a little comic book track. It's called This Was Your Life. This Was Your Life. Probably the oldest chick track, C-H-I-C-K, uh, chick publications. Probably the, the, the first one, the oldest one, and the most effective one in presenting the gospel, I would think. And I was talking with someone here recently, and I think they were giving a testimony how that it worked. Uh, this, this gentleman always, uh, uh, he had one of those This Was Your Life tracks. And, and uh, at the plant, this guy would always come by and say, hey, want to give you one of these? Want to give you one of these? As he's just working, going from place to place. Want to give you one of these? And just handing them out. Was that you, the Bill? Yeah, yeah. And uh, just, just, just kept handing them out to folks, handing them out to folks. And Brother Bill was telling me how that, uh, that this guy... Uh, that he was handing him out to, uh, he, he would avoid him. He'd see Bill coming, and, and he would go a different way and, and all that kind of thing. And, and finally, he got one, got one to him. That, that gentleman trusted Christ as his Savior. You may not know exactly what to say. Satan might beat you up and say, you need to memorize some Bible verses. You need to uh, get a plan. You need to study and then witness. Don't wait on that. Don't wait on that. Just have a desire to, to please God, to witness for him with your lips, witness with your life. Let them see a difference. Don't hand him a gospel tract and, and cuss uh, the, the two minutes later. 
Don't have the wandering eyes. Don't laugh at the dirty jokes. Make sure that your life backs up what your lips say. That's probably one of the greatest hindrances to people witnessing is because they know that their life is hypocritical to what they're saying. Witness the gospel. Pastor Kifa Sampangi in Uganda, 1973, Easter. Uh, this was during the rule of Idi Amin. Y'all remember that name, Idi, Idi Amin? He wiped out and murdered over 500,000 people. They had death squads that went out as agents of the government to homes and to people in the neighborhoods, and they would murder them. 500,000. Easter 1973, Pastor Sambangi, he said, I'm not going to let anything stop me from witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. He invited everyone to come to the soccer stadium. They had 7,000 people at the Easter Sunday. He witnessed of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that a servant risen Savior is in the world today. He lives. He lives. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. I mean, he preached. As he left the stadium, five soldiers were sent to him by Idi Amin. They followed him back to his church. He walked in the church. They followed him in. Five guns trained on him, said, we're going to kill him. By the way, they killed people because they were Christians. That's why they, that's, that's what happened. He said something like this. He wrote in his book. He said something like this. He, he said, you know, uh, he thought about his, his wife and his, and his precious, beautiful daughter. He thought, I'll not see them again down here on this side of glory. Started to tremble a little bit. It's natural. And then he wrote, he, he said that he turned to them and he, he said, you know, the Bible tells me that I'm already dead in Christ. And my life is hid in Christ. So ultimately, you can't really kill me. He said, but I'm praying for you because you are already dead. As far as your relationship with God, you are dead in your sins. And I'm praying for you. When you do this, that will just be another nail in your coffin. The captain stood there for a quite a long time. A few seconds seemed like forever. He lowered his gun. He said, Pastor, would you pray for us? He prayed for them. He prayed with them. He led that captain to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Instead of those soldiers being his executioners, they were his escapers. They took the pastor and his family and, and, and got them safely out of Uganda. He's continuing on. You, you can read the story. He was a witness of the gospel. Walk with God. Witness the gospel. And last, I, I, I wish that, that we had more time, but, but last, warn the government. If you're going to do something right, if you're going to do something right in this world, if you're going to leave a mark for the Lord Jesus Christ, then do what the Bible tells us to do. Walk with God, witness the gospel, and warn the government. You say, well, preacher, uh, where is that found? Turn with you to, to the uh, book of Ezekiel, if you will. It's right before Daniel, in case you're wondering. I'll read a, a verse from Ezekiel chapter 3. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Ezekiel 33 is where we're turning. Ezekiel 33, God made his man a watchman to the nation. We as children of God are watchmen for our nation. I'm going to prove that to you in just a moment. The Bible says in Ezekiel 33 and verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. I am not a prophet. 
I'm not a prophet. I do not prophesy the future. I speak forth the words of God, but I'm not a prophet. But we are all watchmen. A watchman is someone who was put up on, on the wall, someone who was put up in a position of surveillance, watching for the enemy, watching for an attack, watching for some secret way that the enemy would come in and, des and destroy and to kill. By the way, the enemy seeks to do that, to steal and to kill and to destroy. His name is Satan. And we're to be a vigilant voice, a vigilant voice to warn the government. I was studying about some things, and I, I read, came across this about uh, crows, the bird, crows. And it's interesting, crows are, are, are very intelligent birds. I didn't really know that. They're very smart. They're super, they're, they're called super smart. And uh, I guess because they're not really pretty and beautiful, and, and they've got that, oh, you know, kind of sound, they're, it's not really pretty. And things, and, but, uh, but actually their brain, their brain, uh, brain mass to body mass is larger than any other bird. They'll recognize your face. They're, they're very smart birds. They, they, they've been seen to take uh, nuts, shells, and that they couldn't bust open. And they've carried them, and they drop them on the road in front of cars. When a car runs over it, then they'll go, and they'll get the nut outside of the shell. They have funerals. They hold funerals for dead crows. No joke. I'm not making this up. You can look it up for yourself. Uh, they're, they're just really intelligent beings. Whenever they go into a, into a field, like a farmer's field, and they're, and they're going and they're trying to, to steal away the crops and all that kind of thing, they'll put a couple of crows up in the trees as sentinels. And they'll, they'll watch. And if they see danger coming, then they, they send out the, the warning and, and boom, they all fly away. Listen, please. When we as a nation are straying from what God said he would bless and God said he would defend and God said he would direct and, and, and how God has blessed our country and blessed our nation without doubt. The world shakes their head in wonder at this grand experiment of a democratic republic. And it, cam it comes from the word of God and we're to have a vigilant voice. If judgment is coming... We must not be silent. It was May 1980. For two months, for two months, Mount St. Helens had been rumbling. Some volcanic, volcanic activity, earthquakes. For two months, geologists had been measuring this. And they said, something's coming. Something's coming very bad. Please evacuate. They got as many people out as they possibly could. May 19th, 1980. You may have watched it on television. As Mount St. Helens erupted, the largest eruption in, in American history. They got everyone out that they thought they, that was on the mountain except for one man. Harry Randall Truman. Harry Randall, and Randall Truman, he, he, he ran a lodge there on Spirit Lake. 83 years old. He had survived World War I. Uh, his uh, ship that he was on was sunk by, by a German U-boat. He had lived through a lot. He said, I, I, you know, I don't believe it enough to leave. In just moments, he was buried in 150 feet of mud and ash. Never recovered his body. Never did. He died. But he was warned. When's the last time... Do you, do you understand that, that the Bible says in Romans chapter 13 that politicians, do you understand that they are ministers of God to thee for good? That's what the Bible says. God said it. When's the last time that you wrote either an encouraging or an exhorting or a, um, uh, a warning letter to Michael Waltz, our congressman in this area? By the way, I'm, I'm hoping, God willing, October 4th, Michael Waltz to be here with us on Pray for America Sunday on October 4th. 
They won't, uh, they won't agree to it yet. His people won't agree to it yet because it's too far out. Had the privilege, Pastor Jim and I and, and others at the, uh, at the direct con, uh, capital connection, had the privilege of meeting him. A born-again believer, Green Beret. And in between meetings, he made time for us to pray with him. A couple of us pastors, Jake Samples and I, had, had prayer for him. And then he prayed with us. An unscripted, humble prayer right off the top of his heart. And I heard him talking with God. He wasn't putting on a show. I'm thankful that we have a representative like that. Whether we have a representative that's born again or not, we ought to encourage, we ought to exhort, we ought to warn. When's the last time you sent something to Rick, uh, Rick Scott or, or uh, Marco Rubio, our senators? When's the last time that you exhorted President Trump? You say, well, he'll never get it. Maybe he won't, but maybe he will. It might be your voice that makes a difference in someone's life. We're a watchman. We've got the voice of God within us. We must, in, with our voice, we must make sure that we warn the government. We, with our vigilant voice and with a visible vote. Um, I, I'll, I'll say more about this sometime later in, in a coming message. But... Um, used to be that we could, we could register people to, to vote just by saying, hey, we'd like to have some registrations and things. Well, thankfully, I guess they're tightening things up. And in Florida, uh, we have to register as, 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 a, as a church a vote, uh, not, not, not to vote, but even to, to offer things for them to be able to, for folks to be able to register to vote. There are people that are, that are just not registered. We can't tell you how to vote. We can simply encourage you to do the Christian uh, American thing and vote. We'd like to make that as... But we're, we're, we're still waiting on that and get our registration number and things, even though they're sending them to dead people and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Jesus said this, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. We think that's taxes. And yes, that's part of it. But in our form of government, you know what we get to do? In Rome, they didn't get to do this. In Israel, they didn't get to do this. They didn't have a vote. We have a vote. Abraham Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address, address 1863. 262 words. It took him two minutes to deliver the, the address. Two minutes. The guy who spoke before him spoke for two hours. He summed up the heart of America in two minutes. He said this. He said, It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. That is our heritage. That's the America we were born in. Abraham Lincoln, I believe, took those words from the prologue of John Wycliffe's Bible where he wrote in the translation of his Bible, the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. 500 years earlier, he wrote that. So today, as a Christian, if you're going to walk with God, if you are going to continue and listening to him, laboring for him, if you're going to witness the gospel with our lips and our life, if you're going to warn the government with a vigilant voice and a visible vote, then maybe you can say, I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to do right. I leave you with this. The master was searching for a vessel to use. On the shelf, there were many. Which one would he choose? Take me, cried the gold one. I'm shiny and bright. I'm of great value, and I do j things just right. My beauty and luster will outshine the rest, and for someone like you, master, gold would be best. 
Unheeding, the master passed on to the brass. It was wide-mouthed and shallow and polished like glass. Here, here, cried the vessel, I know I will do. Place me on your table for all men to view. Look at me, called the goblet of crystal so clear. My transparency shows my contents so clear. Though fragile am I, I will serve you with pride. And I'm sure I'll be happy your house to abide. The master came next to a vessel of wood. Polished and carved, it solidly stood. You may use me, dear master, the wooden bowl said, but I'd rather you used me for fruit and not bread. Then the master looked down and saw a vessel of clay. Empty and broken, it helplessly lay. No hope had the vessel that the master might choose to cleanse and make whole to fill and to use. Ah, this is the vessel I've been hoping to find. I will mend it and use it and make it all mine. I need not the vessel with pride of itself, nor the one who is narrow to sit on the shelf, nor the one who is big-mouthed and shallow and loud, nor one who displays his contents so proud, not the one who thinks he can do all things just right, but this plain earthy vessel filled with my power and might. Then gently he lifted the vessel of clay, mended and cleansed it, and filled it that day. Spoke to it kindly. There's work you must do. Just pour out to others as I pour in to you. All we need is God to pour into us, and then we pour out. All we need is to be that little boy's lunch. Just five loaves and two fishes. And he kept breaking it and multiplying it and breaking it and multiplying it. Just do right. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Today, what do you need to do? What do you need to change? Some of you, God's gnawing on your heart about something. It might be something as basic as getting baptized. It might be something as simple as becoming an official member of this church. It might be something about witnessing for him, about walking with him sincerely every day. What is it that God's dealing with your heart about? Not a lot of flashing lights. Not a lot of wild party. We're talking, all of that is still to come. All that's going to be in heaven. Down here, it's simple and easy for each and every one of us. Just do right. 12-year-old boy, 12-year-old boy, got saved in old-fashioned revival. Next day, he showed up with his friends, and he told them that he got saved. They said, well, how'd you know? How'd you know that God was speaking to your heart? Did you, did you see a vision? He said, no. He said, did you hear God's voice? He said, no. Well, then how'd you know? He said, well, it's kind of like when we're catching a fish. And we got our, our pole and our line. And we can't see him. And we can't hear him. We we'll feel him tugging. You know you got a fish on the other end. He said, I felt God tugging on my heart. If you ignore God's tugging, he'll stop speaking. Don't let him do that. Answer his call. Heavenly Father.